G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel as the AFL off-season rolls on. Obviously, we're doing a combination of different formats of uh, sport at the moment. I'm delving into a bit of cricket content, but I thought uh, over the course of the last few weeks and stuff, there has been uh, more and more calls from people wanting more like individualized videos on certain teams. So I thought I'd have a crack at doing a little bit of a series for you, starting today with the Western Bulldogs and sort of talk about uh, you know how 2023 went. I am going to have a crack at a uh, plotting their best 22, talk about their off-season and potentially their prospects, not just for next season, but going forward. Um, so I'll do my best to try and analyze each team and just give my general thoughts. Now, how often I do this this video series, I am yet to decide. It will depend a little bit on you know the interest you guys have in it, how much time I've got around other commitments. It may be something that I work through over the course of the off-season, but we're gonna start today with the Western Bulldogs. I thought alphabetically made sense, but I always start with Adelaide, um, and you know I, I th thought I'd do it in reverse order this time. So we're gonna start all the way down at the Western Bulldogs. Now, as an opposition fan, I think the Western Bulldogs kind of present as one of the more interesting case studies in the league, relatively speaking anyway, uh, because as far as I'm concerned, I've always seen them as a team who's probably just had the potential to do a little bit better than they have. Um, I mean, to be fair, they won a premiership in 2016, so I'm more thinking post that era, because you know you can't do better than a premiership, and that was a wonderful achievement. So we're really talking about you know since then, um, particularly in the last three or four years, is we've kind of seen a mixed bag from the Western Bulldogs. And to be fair, I think it's it's a fair observation to make that they've probably underachieved uh, in terms of what they've actually been able to produce on the field compared to what I think they should be producing. And to be honest, I think that is a viewpoint that is shared by their fans as far as I can tell. In fact, it's hard to imagine a Western Bulldogs fan that doesn't think they've underachieved in the last three or four seasons. Obviously, a lot, a lot being said about Luke Beveridge, his tenure, uh, to what extent is he safe. But this all comes in the wake of uh, you know a pretty disappointing season, arguably one of their most disappointing seasons in the last eight years or so. Uh, other than when they missed the finals in 2017, this year probably hurts a little bit more, particularly when you factor in you know where they were in 2021. You know, I think back to that final series, they, well, even across the, the course of that year, they were certainly one of the best performed teams that season in 2021. From memory, uh, you know, the, the couple of late season losses kind of cost them that top four berth, and that top four berth is something that's diluted them throughout this whole period of them being a good side. We saw a, a bit of a lackluster finish to that season, not unlike 2016, actually, where they, they slipped to seventh. Uh, in 2021, we saw a late season, you know, stumble at the hurt, last hurdle. And then the team that came out in that final series was completely different, which is again, reminiscent of 2016. And uh, the two finals wins that stick out in my memory are, you know, that Bailey Smith goal to seal the win at the Gabba against a very good Brisbane Lions outfit. Then to do that again, seven days later, and when I say do that again, I mean to an even greater extent and smash Port Adelaide on their home deck by 71 points, th that point in time, you're like, oh my God, this Bulldog side has arrived. Now, of course, the grand final didn't go their way. Uh, they were, you know, what were they up? They were up by about three goals in the third quarter. It was a weird grand final. We reflect on it and on paper, it looks like a bashing, but it was actually a really good game. And the, the Bulldogs were unlucky to be on the end of uh, what was an amazing Melbourne performance. So that's just setting the scene. I didn't mean to delve too much into 2021, but setting the scene for them, you know, to come out in 2022 and finish eighth was an underachievement. But then they went a little bit further this year and missed the finals entirely. And uh, in particular, really lost their bite, to use a silly dog pun there. Uh, particularly the way they ended the season with a couple of losses against poor teams. So what went wrong in 2022? Well, I mean, you know, just looking at it on a surface level, their, their ability to compete with those top teams kind of evaporated this year. They didn't really take any big scalps. You know, they, they knocked off Geelong at GMHBA at the end of the year, but... Geelong were not the side that they were in 2022. Um, they had early season wins. They did beat Brisbane, admittedly, at Marvel. Um, and I think they beat the, the Blues at one point, but that was before the Blues came good. So this Bulldog side, you know, when they're on, is is as good as anyone. And, and, and it's typical of them to take it up to good teams. And that was just something that we didn't see in 2022. And we know that they're a dominant midfield. That midfield is arguably the best in the competition. Um, you know, in terms of star studdedness, maybe not in terms of balance, which we'll get into when we look at their best 22, but it's a dominant midfield and it's actually second in the league for clearances uh, this year behind the Brisbane Lions. But a byproduct of their, their star studded midfieldness -ness is that uh, it kind of pushed out some of these, you know, gun midfielders into awkward positions. You know, Jack McRae has been a gun midfielder of the competition, kind of got pushed out to a wing this year. The same thing with Bailey Smith, wing and half forward. Um, to be honest, I personally think he does have the tools to be a very good wingman half forward, but his natural game 
is as a as a midfielder and we saw him get lost at times throughout the 2023 season you know even someone like Adam Trelaw who is you know good enough to be in any team's midfield rotation got pushed a little bit to half back so that was just a bit of a balancing act we saw with the Western Bulldogs this year so while you know their midfield dominance was there it just didn't really translate to wins on field like I said failed to take any big scalps looked a little bit middling at times and then even towards the later the end of the season they look like they should have played finals lost to Hawthorne in Tasmania and then got shocked by West Coast uh, probably a bad week to play West Coast <laughs> I mean there was only three good performances all year but that really summed up their season and uh, naturally we saw them miss the finals so let's talk a little bit about list changes and I'll talk about their best 22 as well in terms of notable delistings I won't mention them all but we saw Josh Bruce retire Hayden Crozier also retired Toby McLean being delisted I think that's fairly notable obviously a premiership player and I know he's done a couple of ACLs but it wasn't so long ago we saw, thought this guy might be a long term AFL player at the Western Bulldogs. They also traded away a little bit of ruck depth with Jordan Sweet requesting a trade home to Port Adelaide. And in terms of their trades, well, interesting trades. Nick Caulfield and James Harms joined the club. Nick Caulfield hasn't played a game in a couple of years. There's no criticism on that, obviously. It's just a case of the Bulldogs throwing a, a speculative trade out there for a guy that has some talent. Absolutely. And James Harms as well probably adds a little bit of seasoned midfield depth. So I guess the only odd thing about that is that Caulfield and Harms probably don't add to a weakness at the Western Bulldogs. Obviously, the midfield depth is not a weakness. Harms maybe plays on a forward flank. Caulfield as well. I think running medium types in their back line is actually a relative strength of the Western Bulldogs too, which we'll get to. But what they also did trade in was pick four, which became pick six, I think, in the end in Riley Sanders. Um, and they don't hold a first round pick next year. So they flipped that. Future first as well as their 2023 first. And they added two first rounders in Jordan Croft and Riley Sanders. And uh, I think it was a pretty productive draft for them. When you had two first round draft picks, even at the expense of next year's first, I think what we've seen with the Bull Bulldogs here, partly by some luck, um, but also through shrewd drafting and trading, they've clearly got an eye on the next generation and they've been drafting talls, you know, Eugle Hagen, Jordan Croft, Sam Darcy. Admittedly, all three of those are through the Academy or Father-Son system, but trading for Riley Sanders was a good move and they're looking at their next list transition. And that's one thing I do admire about the Western Bulldogs and the position they now find themselves in. We also saw them draft some genuine wingers. So when we're going to talk about their best 22, that's probably one thing they lack. And admittedly, with late picks, they added guys like Aiden O'Driscoll, Joel Frazier, as well as a young ruckman in Lachlan Smith, presumably to replace Jordan Sweet on the list. Cool. So I've had a crack at um, the best 22. Now, bear with me, guys. I know like it's hard for me as a, as a non-Bulldogs fan to get this right. My opinions are on this particular issue are probably weaker than some of the you know actual big dogs fans out there. I mean, I do generally like big dogs. My sister used to have two big Siberian Huskies. I just meant big Bulldogs fans. So let's take a look at their best 22. This is my best effort. It, and um, that is, in particular, a really good spine. That's probably where I'd start with the Bulldogs. We've already talked about their midfield. You've got Bontempelli, Liberatore, Trelaw, Bailey Smith, and McRae. Like, that's not an area of, of weakness for me. And also medium defender types, like I just alluded to. The strength of that is really strong, especially when you consider past performance. You know, Caleb Daniel and Bailey Smith uh, were both late draft picks as well and uh, have become... All Australian defenders in very in different years. Ed Rich has also had a really good, well, year at least this year. And the fact that I've also got a couple of defenders in Durea and Johannesson on the bench uh, shows that that is not an area of weakness. So, of course, recruiting Nick Coffield, I couldn't include him in this best 22. He doesn't, hasn't played a game for a couple of years. That doesn't mean he won't find himself. And hasn't played a game for a couple of years. That doesn't mean he won't find himself in the team at some point. And you think Durea is getting closer to the end than the start. Same thing with Johannesson. Now, previously, you know, the, the Bulldogs probably had some issues in terms of tall defensive depth and that's one thing they've added to so of course they've recruited Alex Keith from Adelaide a number of years ago but Liam Jones rejoining the AFL was a big win for them he had a good 2023 season but in particular the recruitment and development of James O'Donnell as a, another tall defender back there has been a massive plus for the Western Bulldogs and one of their biggest positives this year the other thing that I think is worth mentioning here as well that they did invest a first round draft pick on a key position defender last year in Jed Buzzlinger who reportedly from what I can gather I haven't watched him myself had a pretty good in the VFL is developing quite nicely and I would say uh, a relatively high level talent so they're in a good position there the, the other two key backs in Alex Keith and Liam Jones obviously on the older end so Buzzlinger coming in I could see I could foresee him getting a number of games this year and long term they'll be set up too there's also the question mark some of their talls I've heard through the grapevine that Jordan Croft might start his career as a defender um, and you know Sam Darcy is another option there as well so to summarize that great midfield also tapped down to by the All-Australian Ruckman in Tim English good short-term key defense 
defensive options there in, you know, Keith and O'Donnell and uh, and Liam Jones there with Buzzlinger potentially coming in, although this is probably an area I would continue to recruit for if I was them. In terms of their tall forwards, these guys are also really well stocked. As you know, if we've been following the draft, I mentioned Hugo Hagen, Aaron Norton as well, pick nine in the 2017 draft, and you feel like he's on the brink of potentially starting to put up 50 to 60 goal seasons. Rory Lobb as well, serviceable third tall forward. Nothing special, but the fact that he adds a point of difference in that forward line, it's certainly not an area of weakness. And there's also Sam Darcy to consider. So I've chucked Sam Darcy on the bench in this particular uh, best 22. I don't really know exactly where to put him. You think as a high level draft pick, I think he's entering his third year now, got a little bit more meat on the bones. Potentially, he is a phase in option for someone like a Rory Lobb. I don't know how they can all play together, but I, I've put him on my bench anyway. One other weakness I see maybe with this, this best 22 is probably some some forward half potency from medium to small type. So of course, I'll point out that Cody Waitman is a very good and talented small forward. That's not who I'm referring to. But if you look at the half forward flanks that I've, I've selected here, Anthony Scott and James Harms. Harms is probably more a midfielder playing on a flank. And then we saw that with Bailey Smith again this year. Now, Anthony Scott is an actual forward, but in terms of output, that's probably an area that they can improve on in their best 22. And I'll highlight someone like Charlie Clark, who was taken in the 2022 draft, if I'm not mistaken, hasn't played a game yet. Didn't have a preseason last year, my understanding is, but he's one player I think could come in by round one and potentially play. I did like him in his draft year quite a lot. I have chucked Riley Sanders there in my best 22 for them as a sub because as the Lark medalist, pick six, I think he's the sort of guy who they're going to give games to early. Does it help their midfield squeeze? Absolutely not, but he's too good to let rot in the VFL. So it's the medium to small forward types that, that probably needs a bit of a, a short-term injection there and potentially some actual classic wingman um, or outside types. You know, McRae being pushed out into wing is a little bit out of position. Bailey Smith, I think, has the tools, like I said, to be a good wingman, but they probably want a more pure wingman. And that probably explains some of their drafting. They drafted two wingers late in Joel Frazier and Aiden O'Driscoll. And Joel Frazier in particular is someone that could potentially play games next year. So that's my crack at analyzing their best 22 and, and giving a summary of their offseason moves. And I guess the outlook for 2024 is the next question. Again, you know, it's going to be the same thing I've, I've said about the Bulldogs for a number of years now. They haven't been able to prove themselves in the home and away season enough to make a top four finish. But look, they've won a premiership in the last seven years and they've made another grand final. So it's not a massive criticism, but I think we can all agree the ability to deliver on potential and promise has continually eluded the Western Bulldogs for a few years now. For as far as I'm concerned, it's, as far as their premiership window goes, it's probably I'd probably be looking at it as as long as they have Bont, that's their window, and therefore they need to recruit around that as well. Because once Bont and Pelly goes, this guy is the clear best player in the competition, in my opinion. Then they lose a lot of you know firepower, not only in the midfield, but what he does up forward when he swings forward as well. I do think their general recruiting over the last number of years, partially by luck and partially through strategy as well, has set them up to have a smooth transition. They've had access to good talent. So they're in a good spot. They're in a good spot. It's never been a talent issue with the Western Bulldogs. It's just whether they can deliver on that said potential. But there you go, guys. That's my crack at analyzing the Western Bulldogs. I hope you enjoyed this video. As always, I welcome your input in the comments section below. And uh, like I said, I'll probably go reverse alphabetical next. So yeah, God, it's another Eagles video. <laughs> Now I'll see, maybe I'll skip the Eagles and do that separately, but uh, we'll see. Hope you enjoyed the video. Would love some feedback and I'll see you in the next video, guys. Cheers.